Hunter x Hunter episode 125, Great Power X and X Ultimate Power. You're the one going needs the most. You're the one going truly needs. Yeah, Kalua's power of pin removal, contagious. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> did this happen off screen? I don't rem Wait, did I just forget? This has a recap feel, but I don't recall Knuckle being in this room. It's funny, the one thing I've been saying this whole time is Knuckle, please don't die. Knuckle just determined to put himself in the maximum danger at all times, and he's not even invisible. What do you make of this in your knuckle? Everyone is gradually assembling into this room. I would have gone would let me. Alternatively, I'm already outside the room. I'm behind you. Yeah. Right. I'm on an escapade with Yupi. Kone's like, when can I kill something? <laughs> Isn't this not a lose-lose for Knuckle, though? If you win, you, you've just beaten the clone. If you lose, well... Oh, wow, and he's with him right now, too. And Yupi has no idea. Who's fighting a war on two fronts simultaneously? Three fronts if you count his, his own <laughs> internal composition and wanting to become king and all that. I love how all the lines are just so blurred. Gon, sweetie, is it okay if we walk out for a second? <laughs> oh no. Knuckle just so obvious. That was still subtle shade from the narrator. The subtitle there was when dealing with someone stupid enough to announce his presence from behind the enemy. You have to appeal to his stupid brain. That's our Knuckle. If I'm going, to, I don't. I don't really find that convincing. Anyway, why do you need to have a discussion outside? <laughs> you definitely should not just trust Poof as a default. I see you've met Gon. <laughs> You can just see that in how everything just shapes around him. If you were somehow able to make a quantifiable list of their individual stats and strengths and looked at all the people on the invasion team on a sheet of paper and tried to decide who should be the one making the decisions, it wouldn't be gone, right? And yet, it feels intuitively correct to me that Gon is sort of the linchpin that everything has begun to form itself around. It's not because he's the protagonist. In fact, interestingly, his protagonist qualities are somewhat in doubt right now. Pure stubbornness alone is not enough by itself, but stubbornness combined with actual leverage you know, an actual threat, strength, the stubborn person's ability to get what they want with or without your agreement, or their ability to take away what you want that perhaps you cannot defend against, or you can defend against it, but the other person's willing to go farther than you are in that struggle. Like in a battle over some course of action, you might stand your ground long enough for things to escalate to the point where the other person's like, well, in that case, I'm just going to do this. And you're like, whoa, 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 I, I, let's not go that far. Fine, you win, you know? Gon is so enraged and, and locked in and credible of a threat enough and has the least to lose, at least in his, his own conception of things and the way he's presenting himself that everybody more reasonable is going to wrap around his will which is dangerous he's like a kid you see this sometimes where you're like oh my parents actually pose no threat and are attached to me being happy and care about other people's perceptions in public more than i do and are bound by consequences more than i am and from that point on it's it's sort of over the kids have figured out through like continuously testing the walls that there really are no limits and then their dark twisted monstrous <laughs> child selves are allowed full reign you see this sometimes in schools like if you really think about it in terms of lower education teachers really have no recourse for anything they have no power, which if you're this kind of person, you're likely not worried about grades. Your parents pose no threat. You'd be happy to be kicked out of school or you figured out that they can't really just kick you out of school or at least it's very difficult to kick you out of school. That the teachers are just fragile human creatures who want to get through their day and go home. That they have to keep a face where you don't. It's a lot of power. People with this kind of stubbornness of will, which often comes from a lack of understanding and clarity and just blind emotion, just blasts right to the top of everything. Since we don't deal with this very often, we're not prepared for that kind of person. And 
we instinctively go into like damage mitigation, which is essentially handing the other person the seat of power and control. Interestingly, the only person I think who really has a lot of leverage in this situation is Kalua, but he's also clearly compromised by his own needs. And so it's unclear which way he'll fall, but he will be the one who has to deal with Gon, it seems. Also interesting is that in that light, Gon is not that dissimilar from the king. Like this is what I'm gonna do and there's nothing you can really do to stop me. So you're either gonna accept what I do or you're gonna die. Actually, maybe the one thing that makes Gon more powerful than the king, although it, it remains to be seen, is the king actually cares about Kamugi. That's his point of weakness. That's the point of leverage over him. Whereas Gon, I mean, I don't know. Hard to say at this point, given his emotional state. That's an interesting point. At least he's in this room. Yes, we're gonna damage control. So, so glamorous, so beautiful, so elegant. I mean, if I'm understanding the power, Poof has a, a trump card that he's not using, which is just nano machine up your nose. That's your punishment. Damn, what a tyrant. Better turn on that Nen. Poof also showing his hand in a big way. What does Poof care about Kamugi? Right, that's a good point. It's not like he's super just lashing out and yelling and screaming because of his rage. This is different. This is like calm, collected rage where he's thinking this through, although emotionally compromised. But it makes it a little bit of a darker energy. I mean, everyone has experienced extreme anger and you know that you lose control. And then when you are you have a, a minute to collect yourself, things become a lot clearer. But it's different when the heat dies down and you're like deliberately holding on to it and have that slow burning, intense feeling of I'm going to get you back for this. That calculating, deliberate hatred. That's a tough call. Not to say this is what I want, but I think the way you deal with Gon, the only way is to let go of the thing you're protecting. I mean, at least as far as I can tell what we've seen, Pito can defeat Gon. If Pito lets go of Kamugi briefly, that ends Gon's stranglehold in this situation. It really is Gon playing on good, warm qualities that they have, you know, limits they have, scruples they have. This forces a decision for for Pito because what good is Kamugi for the king if the king's dead? Yeah, Gon maybe weaken himself by going too far, pushing everyone into a corner. Knuckle. <laughs> Yubi would protect her too, though, I'm guessing. <laughs> That's a huge relief. <laughs> My friend. Now. Amazingly. Somehow. It's a lot to explain to Gon and Gon wouldn't listen. In this bizarre hunter exam condition, defeat me without killing me. Speaking of leverage, the king wants to know his name. I don't think he needs it that badly. He can make his own name. This is different. It's the greatest moment of Netero's life. When he started getting overpowered and therefore bored. This was before or after the gratitude punches. It's so cool. This whole this whole thing. This whole deal. 99th hand. Skipped a few there. It's somewhat reassuring that he's at least giving the king trouble. Or at least giving the earth trouble. 
Something really disturbing about that image. God pummeling you, pummeling you. <laughs> This is a moment of reflection and realization at, at what feels like the end. Did he lose the gratitude at some point? Lost the true spirit of brotherhood through combat? Became drunk on his own ability and power? Started seeking fun and thrill, wildness and randomness over actual, real deeply rooted conviction and love of the thing? Recently I was thinking about something that seems related to this, which to put it very broadly would be something like the, the traps of hedonism, but way more broadly than I think what I initially thought hedonism to mean, instead of it being a life of pleasure seeking, way more broadly being just a, a life of seeking personal self-gratification. So like, just imagine a scenario where through a sequence of events, maybe even your own hard work and endeavors, you have all the material things you could ever want at your disposal. You are irresistible to any and all romantic or sexual partners that you like. People treat you as though you are a king among men or a god among men. No one can best you in the thing that you do or perhaps even in anything. You have reached truly the peak. You are the best along this plane of things that I think typically is what we're looking for, what we're striving for, what we're most rewarded for in this very particular plane. Even imagining it is pleasurable. Right? Wouldn't that be great? And the fact that it's so internally rewarding along that very humanistic animalistic mechanism of thinking about things and that likely you work really hard to get there the fact that everyone around you everything you see mirrors the idea that this is the correct path that you have reached the top of something truly important it's not hard to imagine and i think you you, you witness and it's easy to understand from experience that that is such a black hole where you sink into that and that's kind of what you stay as and you don't even want to look at anything else because it feels like that would require you starting over from scratch like giving up everything this image of yourself you've cultivated all the you utility you get from thinking of yourself as number one. Which, for the record, while I mentioned being the, the best as the hypothetical example, it doesn't actually require a ranking or require anyone to be at that grand level of a thing for it to also be a danger. Like, it could be among any one criteria at any level that just gives one the feeling of satisfaction in that way. And yet, I would wager a guess, I have this strong feeling that there's so much more that that misses. Personally, I felt this in a very limited way. Like, I'm not, by any stretch of the imagination, the top of anything. But I think in certain ways, my life, and this is probably true for a lot of people, is what other people people out there somewhere would dream of having and are working towards. And it is a great thing. I don't mean to disparage any of this. I think that multiple paths can be explored and maybe should be explored at once because it's part of the human experience. So there are things I really do enjoy about that. And I think that's okay. But there's also this very clear feeling that that can't be it. It can't just be me enjoying my life and pursuing what is fun and exciting and feels good because that kind of runs its course. And at a dark extreme requires you pushing the envelope farther and farther where you're looking for stimulus. You're chasing the feeling. You're chasing the, the one higher, which creates a trade-off at a certain point where you're now sacrificing things that are actually really good. Maybe you're taking more risks, you're sacrificing your own safety, you're putting others to the side, you are losing some humility, which blinds you, all in the name of chasing that feeling that you're addicted to. I can't quite articulate perfectly what the other side of it is, but I have a feeling it's something like service. Using the things you've obtained, using the resources you've cultivated and your natural gifts and intuition, the wisdom that comes from your experiences, to not just be a participant in it, not have the highest output be just your own personal feelings, because those are fleeting, but rather to accumulate things and then synthesize them into a new tangible real thing creating a systemic improvement that is in service to other people like compare i did all this work i accumulated all of these resources i went through all these experiences and the final output is i feel good for a lifetime that's not terrible it's just temporary it's fleeting and at its extremes can be destructive through its selfishness two i accumulated all this and I added one thing, no matter how tiny, that is now an input into greater humanity that will outlive me, that will outlive the feelings of joy that I have, that is more important than me walking around thinking about how great I am and how cool I am that I can live this life and how envious other people are of me and this feeling like I've won. I think I can make a somewhat naturalistic argument for this, where it seems like a big aspect of nature as is reflected in humanity is this process of not just perpetuation, but perpetuation and one step up. Any individual's life is limited, the contributions one's life has has the potential to be a lot more enduring, perhaps even infinite. Life seems to be in this constant pursuit of taking decaying matter, yet finding a way to create a new input that is additive and greater than just the raw components of which it's composed. Let's say there's an organism that's just perfect in every way and lives a great life, but does not reproduce, leaves no legacy, just really enjoys, it has a great fun time and all the dopami dopaminic, whatever, neurons are firing constantly throughout this limited lifespan. And it just experiences extreme ecstasy its entire life and then dies 
I would argue that there actually is some importance of beauty in there, but in a sense, it sort of feels to me like from nature's perspective, that's a dead end. What's cool is as humans with so many abilities and skills, we're not limited to reproduction in terms of a legacy. In fact, you could argue there are much greater legacies we could have than reproduction or co in combination with reproduction. Nevertheless, the point remains that to have it be all about you, your joy, your experience is not the whole thing. It's not the whole picture. It's not necessarily what we're here for. Despite what you might call our obsession with happiness, you know, and one's own feelings and one's own state, maybe that's not as important as we thought. You know, it's interesting to think we can contrib contribute. We can do all of this that I'm mentioning, this other side to things without feeling good at all, you know, without feeling like we have any significance or importance. And that can also be cut to directly. You can aim for that. You can aim for a contributing force without yet feeling like you're amazing or you're the best or the king or a god walking the earth without being sexually desirable, what have you. Though you might imagine that those material rewards might follow if you were successful in that arena. So maybe we have it backwards and maybe it's not seeking the happiness first. And now that I've got that down, I can turn my attention to this other thing. Maybe it's the other order where you turn your, your attention to what truly matters and you likely will get rewarded for that, but it also sort of won't matter if you do. I just think it's important to recognize that there's a trap in there and that it's probably not the whole thing. If that's given more power than it truly deserves. Actually, I was thinking exactly about this thing. I'm like, how did somebody who came up through gratitude and discipline and hard work and love of a thing end up as this sort of self serving, thrill seeking, I want to push the envelope because it's fun version that we see now. This may be Netero's reckoning and also an our coming full circle. It's time to remember your gratitude. You got a little bit bored. You got a little bit sidetracked, I think. We're going into the subterranean, taking this downstairs like it's a Tekken level, but the opponent takes no fall damage. So elegant, so graceful, so majestic. The music is great. Nero created Dragon Ball Z levels of dust. I see dust, I immediately... I hear the narrator saying, next time on... <laughs> what is this, like, Attack on Titan basement area? Oh. It would be really cool if he pulls it off, but he won't. There's too much left to happen. And for the first time, the king felt fear? Maybe? I love how it, all this godliness and what it comes down to is just a giant slap. Slap by the hand of God. It's glorious. Oh, he got- oh, he- well, he's not getting destroyed at all. He's just getting moved around a lot. It's a lot of motion. Zero damage. Somehow. What a tremendous zero HP attack that was. <laughs> well, I'm glad you made peace. Is there more? Oh, he's, he's like regained himself. Oh, he made a little heart. <laughs> That's so great. That's amazing. He literally made the heart pose. That's how grateful he is. He has one more attack coming. It's going to be really powerful. Full gratitude. Okay, this is, this is, this makes sense. I was wondering where this Netero was. Like the, it wasn't adding up the flashback to this, to the modern day. I mean, that's another struggle, even for people who really have truly tremendous, amazing, benevolent aims and want to do things for others and want to find real beauty in the world. It's not something that really ends. And that can be a little bit discouraging because you fight this difficult fight. You do all this hard work and you get to a level where you're like, wow. That was really something. And you get the reward of accomplishment. I wanted to do something. I set out to do something. I used my ingenuity, my hard work, and my two hands, and I made it. I made it reality. And you get this flood of good feelings. But you still have potential. You still have gifts. And you've already completed that section. That's kind of done. And you know what? It's not the end of the world if you just stay there and you enjoy the fact that you did that and you live the rest of your life feeling happy about what you've done. I'm not going to hate on that because at least you did something. At least you did something amazing and miraculous and wonderful. But if you're still following that same spirit, you are still the, the same person with gifts to give and maybe even with greater potential having gone through that experience. So there's still the same calling to continue. It's a little bit tiring to think about, you know, like when does it end? But another way to look at it is it's not about you to begin with. If it really is about the work, it's about the gift, it's about service to you could say humanity, but in a greater sense, you could maybe say existence itself. You could even say God, though I hesitate to use those words because of the connotations it brings in. Then it doesn't matter if you're tired, you know? It doesn't matter if you, you want to just rest. It doesn't matter how good you feel about it. Though thankfully those things can exist simultaneously. It can be all of those things. It's a very fine line. We're always living on sort of a pendulum. Your best traits become your worst. Your worst traits become your best. Your accomplishments undo you, you know? It's so it's so complicated. It is really cool in this fight that it unlocked the better Netero. Even if it did zero HP, that was maybe a win. It's good from a character perspective. I'm really curious to see how the king will react to that attack and to Netero's changed demeanor.